I am now honored to introduce our panel host, Dr. Taylor Chastain Griffin. Dr. Chastain Griffin is the National Director of Animal Assisted Intervention Advancement for Pet Partners. In her role, she focuses on supporting research and professional development within the therapy animal arena. Having witnessed hundreds of interactions between her own therapy animals and the people with whom they visited, Taylor is passionate about bolstering the intervention with empirical investigation. Dr. Chastain Griffin obtained her doctorate in research psychology in 2018, with her studies focusing on the human-animal bond as it is experienced in the context of shared traumatic experiences. Through her undergraduate education in psychology and animal behavior to her graduate work to become a mental health counselor, Dr. Chastain Griffin has always strived to shape her educational and professional endeavors with the foundational goal of promoting AAI. Dr. Chastain Griffin is also a dog trainer, Pet Partners team evaluator, and has been a registered handler with Pet Partners since 2015. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Taylor Chastain Griffin. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. So excited to have this dialogue. Um, this is the place where you get to ask questions and we will do our best to answer them. So I want to take a moment to introduce um, my panelists here today. Um, we have some really great experience represented in this crowd. First, Dr. Lori Kogan is a licensed psychologist, a professor of clinical sciences for the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Colorado State University. She holds many leadership positions in the HA space and is a very accomplished author as well. Um, Dr. Miller is a postdoctoral fellow within a One Health lab at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her PhD is in stress biology and behavior, and her research focuses on protecting animal and human welfare through measuring physical health and mental health indicators. And she's currently doing some research that we're very proud of um, in collaboration with Habri's funding and Pet Partners funding on pet ownership changes during the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, Dr. Dan Dooley is a superintendent, adjunct professor, and chair of our um, soon-to-be-launched uh, Association for Animal Assisted Intervention Professionals board chair. Um, he's not only started a successful therapy dog program, but he's mentored over 50 school districts on how to start similar programming. He incorporates 30 handlers into his therapy dog program, and these handlers have all different kinds of professional identities, social workers, librarians, reading specialists, um, so you can see a lot of expertise here. Please do put your questions in. I'm going to be on the lookout for those, but first I'm going to start with my first question for you, Dr. Kogan. We have so many people here from so many different fields in the HAI space. Can you talk to us about where we've come from um, and where um, we are in the field in terms of working together as practitioners and researchers? Sure. Um, and, and first, thank you so much for having me. So I, it is always wonderful to be able to talk about this topic and meet um, even virtually with so many people that have similar interests. So it's, it's such an exciting time for the, the entire realm of human animal interaction um, and animal assisted intervention. So I feel like, and then it kind of dates me, I guess, to say this, but I mean, I remember back in the day <laughs> where it was really just kind of antidotal stories, you know, and we all knew what we saw, um, but there wasn't any research to support that. And, and that I am blown away by how far that we have come in such a short period of time that we've gone from these like case studies and antidotal stories to really solid research showing the tremendous impact that we can have for a huge variety of different populations. Um, and I am, am super pleased to be partnering with Pet Partners, you know, who I feel like has, has really been instrumental in driving this. Um, and then Habri as well as kind of providing this avenue for information. Um, because really when we look at how to move the field forward, we really wanna bring practitioners and researchers together. And I think those are two great examples of organizations that do that. So, um, you know, that it's exciting to be part of their teams as well. So. Issue with unmuting myself. So I'm gonna leave myself off mute for everybody. My next question for Dr. Dooley, we're talking about the importance of coming together as researchers and practitioners, and you oversee so many different practitioners um, in this space. Tell us why you desire to work with researchers to capture what you do day in and day out. And you are on mute, Dr. Dooley. 
apparently I was having the same problem with my <laughs> button as you were. Um, thank you for everyone for having me. Uh, what an exciting topic and what a honor to be able to uh, continue to collaborate and discuss within uh, this realm of uh, topic. But this year in school districts, it's really a tough year. Um, COVID has taken a toll on school districts, um, not only in New Jersey, but across the country and beyond. Um, we're dealing with some issues regarding mental health, um, some issues uh, in regarding social and emotional learning, school culture and climate, student behaviors that we haven't seen in quite some time, if ever. Um, so when we go ahead and we try to figure out simple ways outside of the box to address these ideas, um, anyone who has worked with an animal and a child can see that there's an immediate bond and benefit for that from that relationship. However, it would be nice if we had some uh, real data that we could point to in order to strategize to meet the significant and real needs of our children and of our school community. For instance, we've been monitoring students in meltdown and crisis. Um, we have a reset room, which these students are taken to with our trained professionals, including school psychologists, social workers, and so on. Without the therapy dogs, we see that this takes uh, approximately 17 and a half minutes to return a child safely back to the classroom. With the therapy dogs, we're seeing that we can return a child safely back to the classroom out of meltdown and crisis in under three minutes. The problem is, is that our sample size is 50 or less. So we need to be able to really collaborate and look into um, different ways that we can track the same information and um, the same programs. So we're comparing apples to apples and then we're able to effectively take that information and that data and apply it directly to schools in a beneficial way, in a targeted way to address the specific needs we are having. That makes a lot of sense and, and perfect segue for our, our next panelist, Dr. Miller, with such a, a impressive focus in the research world. Um, what suggestions do you have for people like Dr. Dooley or anyone who's joining us today who has these wonderful programs going on? Um, how can they partner with researchers to get some measurements um, and data behind what they're doing? Excellent question. And also, thank you so much for having me here. It's a true honor and the human animal bond is an immense passion of mine. Uh, to answer the question, I would say that having a open mind in regards of um, just learning different strategies in order to create a robust um, pool of results. Um, with research, design is just absolutely critical in order to just propel um, uh, future studies to build off of any work that is generated. Um, so in addition to that, I would say an open line of communication as well. Um, but I would say those are just two important strategies as well as just being able to develop a collaborative team as well. Individuals from different research backgrounds can provide um, just different advice, provide a diverse tool set in order to um, just really uh, create a sound study that can um, just lead to other studies that can bolster the power of or the effects of AI. Absolutely. And if anyone on here today, um, whether a researcher or practitioner, you have a, a study in mind, do um, be mindful of the fact that Habri has recently um, released funding available. Pet Partners make some supplemental funding available as well. Um, so that RFP is open. We'd love to see um, your proposals come in. I saw a really interesting question come in, and this is for everyone. So um, whoever wants to chime in first, but um, it was noted that there are now many, many students, many people interested and working in the HAI or AAI space, but unfortunately, sometimes these paid positions can be hard to come by. Um, so there was the question, what can we do to increase the frequency of these opportunities? Does anyone have any ideas um, for that? I can jump in first. I, I, I think that really the answer kind of lies in what we're talking about now is, is, is in research. Um, that being able to show that, that what we're doing is, is actually truly effective. And the more that we can do that, then the more that we're able to apply for funding or 
maybe get it included in insurance or you know other types of, of venues for funding, which then leads to these paid these paid positions. So I think we're heading in the right direction. I would agree with Dr. Kogan. Um, we need to continue to um, emphasize the correlation between the positive effects of these programs. Um, we need to be able to show how the data supports um, the, the long and expansive use of these programs. Um, and we need to be able to present that in many different facets and watch the, um, you know, the animal human bond uh, initiative grow because there is multiple spaces, um, especially uh, now um, with you know so many people's uh, social emotional levels and and uh, you know negative uh, experiences and effects and stresses of of daily living. Absolutely. It is amazing to watch when you are able, um, there are some people who might be skeptics in, the, in this world when you talk about the power of animals and when you're able to come up and have um, a study or some data to talk about what you're doing, it really does make such a big difference. Um, another question that I saw come through and Dr. Miller, I have a feeling this one will really resonate with you. Um, how can we bring all of us in this HAI fold together um, into an effective One Health program focus? Uh, so far, yes. Yeah, so, it, like, in I regards to One Health, the really interesting um, I'll, I'll, I'll component about it is that it acknowledges that I'm there's through, interconnectedness, you know, interconnectedness between human and animal health, um, as yeah. well as acknowledging yeah. that there's like, a like, huge so. effect of environment that can drive just different mental health and physical health outcomes. But another huge proponent of so One so Health far. that I think I is know, often overlooked that is that um, in order to tackle just a just diverse array of public health concerns and whatnot, you need a, a, a multidisciplinary uh, team. So a team of experts, a team with different backgrounds um, that have dedicated their careers to learning, you know, these specific topics. Of course, having individuals somewhat versed in bits and pieces of uh, research is advantageous in order to, you know, create a, just a, a sound team in order to drive um, a well-designed study. Uh, but having a team of individuals that have this extensive, long background in um, varied fields related to the topic at hand, of course, AI, different contexts, that will, that will bolster a efficiently just design study as well as um, just really tackling just all the necessary pieces more thoroughly uh, within the context of um, said study. Absolutely. So we've talked some about how we can come together um, on the front end to design studies and to make sure we're capturing what we, we do. Um, Dr. Dooley, what ideas do you have as, um, with the practitioner lens in terms of bringing the findings that already are in existence or that are coming out to practitioner audiences? So I think that, uh, you know, the, the, there's some challenges with that. And the challenge is, is that every program uh, is done with a different amount of implementation and fidelity. Even the 50 schools in which I've mentored to implement a therapy dog program into uh, their districts, the way that they're doing it is completely different. And I also tell the, each school that we mentor to start off with a focus. What is it your children or your learning community needs? And then instead of trying to uh, have a, a, a therapy dog program um, that, that you know, is a one size fits all. Really figure out your niche and how it can be specific to the needs in which you're having. And I think until we're able to put best practice, right? A way of truly implementing, implementing with fidelity and, and we're uh, doing this in a way that is effective in, in and as it relates to research based information. Um, that will continue to get inconsistent results um, in regards to the best outcome possible student achievement data uh, that could be related. Yeah, that makes sense. I want to invite our other panelists too. Any thoughts on that, on 
what Dr. Dooley is talking about or how bringing findings into the, to the minds of practitioners? Yeah, so um, two things I would say. One is uh, I completely agree with Dr. Dooley in that you really need to consider just the context of the students, the individuals that you're trying to, that you're trying to help, um, especially uh, students or individuals from racial ethnic minority backgrounds. These individuals come from, uh, are at a higher odds of coming from um, just vulnerable communities that are at a higher risk of poverty or at a higher risk of having a lack of opportunities for education, economic growth for the family, et cetera. So being able to get a full extent of information in regards of who your, who your study involves, what's your, what's your population, um, just who, what, when, things, the basics, the basics in order to um, really just build um, what, you're, what you're aiming to do. Um, so I wanted to touch upon that. I wanted to touch upon that. I guess I can also add that I think that we still have a little bit of ways to go in that it feels sometimes like researchers and practitioners are kind of in their own separate silos. Um, and I think that research for a lot of practitioners, they, they don't quite understand how that really applies to them on a day to day basis or why that's important to them. And, and I believe that it's researchers responsibility to, to kind of help bridge that gap and to help explain why it would be useful for them. Because um, I, I do often feel like a, a lot of organizations are either very much kind of university-based or, or practitioner-based, and there's not very many. I'll put a plug in for the APA, the human animal interaction section that is open to everybody. But there, you know, in places like Habri that really are open to everybody, that, that people can start to come in together and talking about it. But I think that researchers forget, I think sometimes that research can be kind of intimidating to people that, that that's not their world. And so I think learning how to communicate research results in, in layperson's terms and in ways that are useful to practitioners is something that I, I feel like is really important. Um, and then I think, you know, as Dr. Miller was talking about, kind of like we've learned when we're going in and offering any type of intervention into a community, maybe not even AAI related, it's really important that we pay attention to what that community is and, and what their needs are. You know, we've learned that we can't go into a community and just pluck ourselves down and, and think that we're going to do these great, wonderful things as an outsider. Um, and sometimes it feels like we're kind of doing the same thing and we're forgetting as researchers, what a huge ask it is to ask practitioners to, you know, to standardize things, you know, to, I mean, that's perhaps really different than, than and runs counter to what they're used to doing, because they're used to saying, well, this particular child, for example, really needs this, and this child needs that, and as a researcher, we're like, oh my gosh, you're, you're changing the protocol, <laughs> you know, and so I think having those types of like open dialogue, you know, can, can really kind of help everybody understand kind of the other team and realizing that we all are on the same team. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you've mentioned some really great resources um, in the APA HEI section and in Havery. We're also so excited again with our the launch of the Association for Animal Assisted Professionals next year um, to bring together these communities. And so if that's something that you're watching and you're passionate about, please do make sure you reach out to us because we will be recruiting um, leadership roles too to help make sure that this happens um, and everything that we're doing. I'm seeing another theme of questions come through and I'm very excited about it. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, so, you know, in all of this that we're talking about, we have such a commitment to making sure that all therapy animals who are being investigated, who are being utilized in practice, don't simply tolerate the work that they're doing, but they actually enjoy it. It's very important. I know everyone here. Um, and so how can we do that? How, what are things that you look for to make sure that the animals are thriving in these roles and open to anyone? I'd love to, oh, go ahead, Dr. Oh, Dewey. No, 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 you first, please. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'd love to jump in. Um, very passionate about animal behavior and a core um, strategy in order to do so to see how the animal is reacting to AAI or how it's um, feeling is that 
there needs to be an understanding that uh, just animals, especially dogs, they communicate through their behavior. So they have varied behavioral displays, they can vary their facial expression, their body posture, and all of these things, they mean different things, especially in different contexts as well. So being, under, being able to understand just basic human dog social communication, to have the handler or other AAI personnel to understand what the dog is trying to convey is crucial. Um, another thing to understand is that, yes, uh, temperament will vary by breed, but temperament more often than not will vary at the individual level. And that's something also crucial to convey. Some dogs will be more happy and sociable within novel environments, unfamiliar environments, but some dogs will just be so overwhelmed that it's just hard to react as if they were at home. Uh, so being able to understand that as well, I think that's key in order to not harm the animal and place the proper animal within an AAI environment. I'd just like to add um, much of what uh, Dr. Miller is saying, but as we implemented, especially in a school district with 30 different handlers for two therapy animals, um, I, I think training is of, the, uh, of, is of the essence. And that's why I think Pet Partners does such a wonderful job offering training and extensive training to not everyone has a comprehensive understanding of things to look for and how to respond and those types of things. I know that they're all receiving that training uh, piece and then the handling piece and, and to make sure we're all speaking the same language to the dog and there's not conflicting messages. Keeping it as routine uh, in one area, whether it's a uh, self-contained special education classroom with multiple behaviors versus a reading setting where there's first graders reading to the animals to enhance or incorporate uh, different reading strategies. Um, but I, I also think it's important for each one of those handlers to build a relationship with the dogs because they have to get to know them. Just as Dr. Miller was saying that they all have, the, I have two of the same breed, but they have two completely uh, different personalities and they have to understand the dog. And they also have to know that one of their prime um, responsibilities is being an advocate not only for the children that they're servicing, but also for the dog in which they're interacting with, with those children. And knowing when, uh, you know, it, it's been an hour or going on two hours with multiple groups, hanging and loving on the dog, that the dog may need a few minute break um, from that, just like uh, we all would. So I think it's knowing the dog. I, I, I think there has to be a level of familiarity. There has to be appropriate training uh, and temperament of the dog, but there also has to be that consistent, um, you know, training for the adults and time for them to form that bond uh, with the animal. This is going to chime in and say, you know, one of the questions that we started with was, you know, what are the advances that we see in the field? And, and to me, this is one of the ones that truly stands out is that when, when this field was still really in its infancy, it was very much a, a one direction relationship of, of how animals benefit people. Um, and then I, I, it's been delightful to kind of see this shift and we're like, oh my gosh, this, this is a relationship and it, and it really has to be beneficial to everyone. And, and then I also, you know, because I, I work primarily with veterinarians and, and when part of my job at, at Colorado State, um, that I see that that animal behavior also and, and our ability to understand and read animals has gotten so much better where we used to just, I mean, really it was an absence of pain and distress, right? I mean, that's what we were really looking for. That is, that's such a low bar and, and that it delights me to be in a field where that's not acceptable. It is not acceptable to say that that's the bar that we're setting. No, we actually want them to be enjoying it, you know? And that's a little bit harder to measure, right? What does enjoyment look like? Um, but I, I feel like we're really up for the task, you know? So it, it's been just a really wonderful to kind of see this transition and, and now studies, you know, we kind of like roll our eyes at a study that, that proposes not including animal welfare. So, um, so that's quite delightful to see. Yeah. 
a major major step in the right direction. I see some some questions and comments coming in too about how trainers can be involved in this. You know, I was a, a dog trainer for many years prior to, to being in this field. And um, it would, I was always trying to communicate to people, especially with, with all animals, but especially with therapy animals, you know, the line between um, training them to prepare them to respond to cues um, so that we have a nice language going between each other, but also not over training them to the point where we're asking of them to do too much we can't read their true affiliative behaviors. Again, we have coursework coming out on this next year. We can't wait to get that dialogue started, but would love to hear from you on the panel today about how you think trainers can join in on this conversation and help practitioners um, and researchers better monitor animal behavior um, in all of these different interactions. I think from a, just a simple research perspective, uh, something that can easily be done is just looking at the frequency of behaviors as well as uh, the duration of behavior. Um, frequency, of course, if um, you can even just look at if a behavior is present or not. So as Dr. Kogan was uh, expressing earlier, just from a, a lay person's approach, having just a basic framework in order to look at the animal's behavior and then make a decision about uh, just how it potentially could be feeling, its welfare state. Um, and then, of course, just understanding the different signs or cues of the dog's behavior that could indicate um, just pleasure or distress and having that communication between uh, just the trainer and the other individual, I think that'll be extremely advantageous. Within the school district, the trainer is a, a significant part, um, has had multiple opportunities to work with all of our handlers, again, for the common language piece, for are my expectations of the dog reasonable? Um, how can I have the dog uh, adjust to different scenarios or situations or what's appropriate in regards to how that unique and individual dog will respond? Um, and also in overcoming any obstacles uh, in the classroom or beyond, with that consistent consultation with the trainer who knows the dogs, who has known them consistently for um, pretty much their entire lifespan, uh, to be able to say, okay, uh, you know, sometimes the classroom's a little bit noisier or more active, and here are some of the things that we can do. For instance, uh, you know, we're going to put that, um, you know, uh, soft bed in the corner, and the, and the dog knows that if they need to regulate, that they are able to go into the corner and to you know, uh, avoid or escape, and that's appropriately, you know, uh, balanced behavior. So, uh, you know, I think it's a constant relationship just as part of the training and, and the bonding part, um, you know, it's just a, it, it's a, a significant part of what we do. I just also feel like with that training also comes helping people understand that, um, it's not as simple as just bringing an animal in into a classroom or into a therapy session that that it really is complex in that, you know, sometimes I mean people are, are really driven to protect their animal at times and how, how does that play out if if there's a situation that becomes uncomfortable for that animal, you know so so training for the human not only in recognizing their their dogs behaviors and their dogs stress signs but then helping them really think through, okay, how, how are you gonna intervene? You know, so you've got your thoughts about how you want your counseling session to go, for example, um, and your dog isn't, isn't in the mood or there's something that makes your dog uncomfortable, you know? So, so helping folks kind of think through that and, and having some plans, um, I think is gonna be really important. And I think that trainers um, could really go a long way towards kind of partnering with, human trainers, what I mean is like training counselors and social workers and people like that on how do we kind of all come together to make sure that we're offering services that are beneficial to our clients or students, but also really taking care of the animals that are involved. 
Absolutely. It's such a great opportunity to, you know, if you're a trainer and you're working with someone who has a therapy animal um, to, to do some practice some role play of what are you going to do when the animal does this? It is tricky business when you find yourself in that situation for the first time with a client or um, with someone receiving services and you have to navigate that. So um, it's, it's really a great point. Um, there's another conversation I want to make sure we get to. We talked about the ways that the field is growing um, in much needed spaces in terms of protecting animal welfare and animal thriving. Another place um, that I'm so excited to see talk about and across all HAI um, organizations is our need to increase DEI, diversity, inclusion, increase representation um, throughout all aspects of who we serve and of who is our practitioners and who's in research. So would love to ask the panel for ideas on how to achieve that. I'll jump in. Um, so I'm very passionate about diversity, inclusion, uh, as well as equity. And one thing that I'll say is in regards of uh, targeting more communities, targeting more populations that come from vulnerable backgrounds in order to make an impact, sometimes trying to do so from a healthcare setting may be quite hard. Um, racial ethnic minorities, uh, they may be at a higher risk of having a distrustful or uncomfortable uh, relationship or um, uh, perceivement of a healthcare provider due to implicit bias. So these subconscious or conscious stereotypes impacting how um, a healthcare provider interacts with their patient or an individual. Um, so looking for uh, different settings in order to make an impact. I think the educational setting as Dr. Dooley was describing is so crucial. Um, uh, I was a teacher briefly and in regards to the classes I taught, one was a uh, class that uh, highly involved individuals with behavioral problems or um, things of that regard. And a majority of these students were of color. So in order to relate and in order to um, just build a, a relationship, I think uh, just HAI is just such a lovely way to do so. Um, and then going into other settings, uh, community settings in order to build rapport and build a relationship in order to um, just broaden the impact of the individuals that you're trying to, to reach. I agree with that. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Dewey. Go ahead, Dr. Kogan, please. Um, but just to say, I, I think it's also really important that we pay attention to um, what people's culture has said about different animals and, and what messages that they've gotten growing up. And um, sometimes I think that, you know, my guess is that 99.9% .9 of us here today are dog lovers, for example. Um, not the whole world is, and, and that's not the messages that they've gotten. And I think that understanding the historical perspective of, you know, perhaps dogs have had a different meaning for dif different ethnic minorities through history and being really sensitive to that and thinking about how then we might want to incorporate that knowledge into animal assisted interventions, you know, so whether that means that maybe dogs are not the right species to use, um, which kind of brings up a whole other issue of how really super careful we have to be when we start looking at other species because we're, we're not super great on recognizing welfare issues with dogs, let alone like hedgehogs or things like that, that we're much more unfamiliar with. Um, but just the idea of, of being sensitive to the different backgrounds that people come from. Yes, just to quickly add in cultural competency. So being able to understand the community that you wish to help, getting a background, getting a history, that's so vital. Exactly. You said it much more succinctly, Dr. Miller. <laughs> oh, thank you. You were great as well, Dr. I I'm very uh, grateful that uh, Dr. Kogan and, and Dr. Miller spoke before because they, they were able to articulate um, my two thoughts specifically. Um, that we have to be culturally sensitive, understanding that uh, in different parts of the world, dogs specifically, um, we implement our program with two greater Swiss mountain dogs, one at 130 pounds, the other at 105, uh, two gentle giants, but larger dogs represent different things, uh, protection, aggression, those types of things, and to be able to really 
and truly understand that. Um, we also partner with our parents um, because we've had, I've had in our community, um, some parents who through cultural uh, concerns do not necessarily take easy to uh, this idea, but they do not want their children to be afraid of uh, dogs moving forward. So we've been able to take the dogs and introduce it to the children in small, um, really snippets um, where the dog's completely on the floor and we have the child come and approach the dog. We have friends of the child come and interact with the dog so they can optically see that the dogs are no threat. Um, but, you know, when we get back to, uh, you know, the, the cultural and, and the equity and the diversity in school districts, we absolutely have to have the people representing every facet that we do that also represents our learning community. And it's also the same in implementation uh, of our therapy dog programs. And I think that what Dr. Miller mentioned about actually being able to target, if I have socioeconomics is one of the key indicators of the uh, impact of learning or the ability of children to learn, um, how am I able to target those students for reading and, and, and make it more, uh, you know, come alive and more enthusiastic or children who were reluct reluctant now want to do it. And you can still do the same thing culturally as well. Target specific concerns that you find across the board or themes and be able to address uh, children's needs uh, through, um, you know, a well-implemented and, and strategic program. Yeah, it, it speaks so much to, as we're talking today, how much beyond just what we might think of when we think of therapy animals or human animal interaction, how much we can model, you know, from, from a distance, how much education we have the room to provide and how important it is on both ends of the leash, if you will, this idea of consent that everyone who's involved is really um, wanting to participate. Um, another question that's come up from the audience is, is related to barriers um, that people have when they're trying to experience HAI um, and, and wanting to know what we can do to make these interventions more common in spaces like universities and mental health centers. Um, you know, we all had the experience of, of having some red tape uh, and trying to bring this intervention to people. So we'd love to hear your ideas on how to bring this programming in new places. This has kind of been my area in mentoring, um, you know, numerous uh, school districts and facilities in implementing the program. Um, you know, there's always concerns and, uh, you know, first and foremost, I, I have them identify the need within their community. Uh, and then I have them target that specific need and then show the value within their community um, and also be sensitive that there are allergies, that there are children that are allergic to, um, you know, so what are you gonna do about that? Are you gonna have the nurse identify these students so you know exactly where they are and in what part of the building and you have an action plan uh, if a child inadvertently comes across, uh, to what extent are these allergies? Um, so I think it's a combination of having the program be targeted and specific and having that relationship through permission slips to service individual students and also making sure that there's space for those who wish not to participate or do not believe in the benefits of the program or through different allergies or just mistrust of, of larger animals or whatever the case may be, um, that it is not infringing upon their daily routines. Um, so I, I would say, you know, have, have a focal point. What is the reason for this program? Share that out with everyone, make that the specific uh, purpose and then also, where is that going to be? If you're doing a reading program, is that in a specific portion of the library? If it's uh, to benefit special education or student, students with disabilities, um, you know, what classrooms will that be? It's not a takeover of the entire school because it can't be. I um, To add to that, with Dr. Dooley's um, lovely breakdown, I, I get several themes from his com or his his discussion in that it very much mirrors a research paradigm. You have your driving question, but you have your objectives. Um, in addition to that, something else that's become prolific within 
working with communities from different backgrounds that face different um, stressors or challenges, obstacles, is community-based participatory research. And that's a strong theme that I get from Dr. Dooley's discussion in that you have these stakeholders active in this process the whole way through, from design to implementation to um, all aspects, solving different problems, foreseeing what are you going to do, things of that regard. And I think just involving at all stages, that can be a really core strategy in order to, to uh, design an effective study and also um, create studies that are reliable to be able to compare to one another. With AAI, there's um, implementation in various contexts and, and there's different, of course, um, uh, just um, components that come with these studies or not even studies, just these um, situations or these, um, a lack of a better word, but what I'm trying to say is um, comparability. Just uh, that's that's also something that I grasp upon. But I'll say that the CBPR that's the main the main apple that I've grabbed. Excuse me, I need more coffee apparently. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. And this is I've this has been such an exciting conversation. I feel like we could probably continue on for much longer. And um, nothing excites me more than being in community with people who are um, equally as passionate about this. And with five minutes left, I would just love to wrap up by hearing from each of you um, what your goals are for the future of this field. I'd say a, a huge goal of mine um, would be the positive welfare aspect of therapy dog welfare. It was touched upon earlier, and that's something that's definitely become quite recent. There's been this long, like past two decades, um, focus on if the animal isn't experiencing distress or harm, then that inherently means that they're experiencing good welfare. And that's not the case. So just being able to drive that we can use different measures in conjunction of looking at if the animal's in harm or distress from a positive perspective, looking at different behavioral signs that show affiliation or comfort, uh, that's a, a core goal of mine. So I would like to propel that. Wonderful. I'll jump in. Um, just to go along with what Dr. Miller was, was just uh, referring to, the day that um, Hope and Sky, our, our district therapy dogs, are uh, you know, not waiting at the door, uh, giving me the eyes, uh, trying to open the door to get to the car to get to school, and, and um, you know, absolutely howling the second I pull onto school grounds will be the day that we have to find another job for them. Um, this has to be mutually beneficial for the animal. And not all animals are suited for this type of work, especially between Hope and Sky. They see over 300 children uh, within three days in the, in the Evsekin School District. But the other part is, I think the future goal for me is to be able to provide opportunity for children. To be an educator is to provide opportunity. So whatever this program and being able to see uh, the benefits of the dogs and the interactions and what that brings academically, socially, emotionally, behaviorally to our children, to be able to do that in a safe way for not only the children, but the animals moving forward and implement that in as many spaces as possible um, so children can benefit in the future. Uh, you know, that's what keeps this program driving and, you know, our mentorship of our surrounding areas as well. And I guess I'm, I'll just jump in and say, you know, it, it is exciting to think about, you know, the future and the potential and, um, and definitely that, that animal welfare piece is such a critical component. Um, but I guess the other things that I, I envision for the future is, is continuing to kind of break down these silos and it's through like conferences like this that are such a great example of bringing together these different voices and and, and maybe I'm real cognizant of this because I, I have my foot in like veterinary medicine. Um, and then, you know, as a psychologist, then there's, you know, that whole world. And then 
psychologists sometimes look at social workers like they're a whole entire different entity, <laughs> um, you know, and, and that we all can come together. And we all have so much to learn. And, and I see this field as so truly interdisciplinary and that it gets richer and richer as we get more involved, as we get more people involved, you know, so the whole one health aspect of this truly, you know, human animal interaction, one health to me, are, are much the same thing. And so that's kind of where I see some of the future. And then with that then comes, I think that we need to pay more and more attention to these marginalized populations. And um, this has predominantly been kind of a, a white field. And, and I'm really hoping to see that change over time as we recognize that, that there's so many benefits for everybody involved. So, so those would be a couple areas that I, I see great potential in the future. Yes, definitely. And uh, our echoes our goals at Pet Partners and at AAAIP to just make this a more accessible field while also protecting the standards that are so essential to doing this well. So um, it has been such a pleasure to have all of you. Thank you so much for your time, panelists, and for all of our audience members for asking your great questions. You can um, reach us on the, the platform um, if you'd like to continue talking if we didn't get to any of your questions um, and have a wonderful rest of the conference.